And good evening, folks, and welcome back to the page, Astronomy by the Bay. Uh, it's Chris Kerwin here from St. John, New Brunswick. Uh, I have uh, Mike Powell here in St. John with me as well. Say hi, Mike. Hello, Mike. <laughs> and, and we, we have Paul Owen in Hampton tonight. So tonight we're trying a simulcast. Uh, we're going to see how this goes um, by running a simulcast on Facebook and YouTube at the same time. I've got uh, three laptops set up here in front of me. So we don't know how this is going to work, but we're going to give it a shot anyway. Um, and this is the way we usually play. We, uh, we just uh, barrel along with it and see how things go. So I'm going to keep an eye on, on uh, your comments on Facebook, and I'm going to try to keep an eye on your comments on YouTube at the same time here. So uh, we'll see how this all ends up. Uh, Paul is running OBS software for me out in Hampton area. I'm running OBS for my computer, so we're kind of merging everything together, and we'll just go for it and see what happens. Uh, so I'll be bouncing back and forth from screen to screen here and as we uh, as we bring in the guys and, and uh, show you what we can offer for you here tonight. Still there? Yeah. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> I heard a click. <laughs> we didn't leave you yet. Oh, perfect. <laughs> yeah, right. being a keyword. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, what we're going to start with tonight is um, uh, while we're waiting for it to get a little bit darker out outside, uh, Paul is going to probably end up with the Markarian's chain for us later on, which is a really nice string of galaxies that is uh, out um, in the Virgo cluster. And I just want to be sure I'm maximized here on my screen. There we are. Uh, and so we're, while we're waiting for it to get a little bit darker for Paul to do uh, his, uh, his uh, live feed, uh, Mike is sitting on Venus right now, and I've got some a uh, little bit of notes and a little bit of talk uh, about Venus uh, that we can use to, to cover part of the evening. Uh, right after our talk about Venus, uh, Mike's going to give us a talk on how to listen to the sun using uh, his e uh, IBRT, Itty Bitty Radio <laughs> Telescope. <laughs> and listening to Jupiter. There, okay. Um, Cobman, moderation, not set. Just a second here. So I'm going to see. Uh, comments over on that Okay. Just bear with me for a second, folks. I'm looking at the Facebook live feed here, too. We are live. And I don't see any comments yet on Facebook, but uh, maybe somebody could comment on Facebook for me to make sure that we're still nice and live here and everything's coming through okay. Looks great and sounds great. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So uh, I'm looking to see where the comments are coming. Just a sec. Just bear with me, folks. Just got to get back to the page here. This is uh, something brand new for us, <laughs> for me anyway. So I'm going to try to watch your comments on both on both streams here. Here we go. Okay, I think I got comments up. Here you're fine. Perfect. Thanks, Dion. And on the other side of the house, we've got Peter, Emma, Trudy, Sighorn, and Lil Toast, and Ben Brame, and Daniel. Thanks so much, folks. Good evening, uh, Louis, as well. Okay, let's get started. So, uh, Mike, I'm going to uh, get you to maybe to share your screen for us. Okie dokie. There you go. Great. Okay. And here's our view of Venus tonight. Um, if you go out now, of course, in the e early evening sky, just after dusk, um, Venus is really, uh, really bright in our evening sky. A lot of people have asked me, what's that bright star they see out in our uh, southwestern sky? And that's the planet Venus, of course. Uh, the third brightest object in our sky behind the sun and the moon. Uh, and uh, we're going to be able to have a, a nice view of Venus for quite a while yet. Uh, Venus is actually on the 24th, I guess that would be tomorrow. Uh, Venus will be at its uh, what we call the uh, maximum uh, eastern elongation. So it'll be the farthest east that it will travel in our sky uh, during sunset. And uh, in at this time of year, this line that we call the ecliptic, which is the path that the planets uh, tend to take across the sky, um, and the sun and the moon take the same path, of course. Uh, at this time of year, the ecliptic is really low or shallow uh, in our morning sky, but it's quite high in our evening sky. So we'll look at Venus uh, being very high in our evening sky, and it doesn't set it, I don't think, till a little bit after 11 o'clock, I believe, tonight. So we've got lots of time yet to take a look at Venus um, through binoculars, or, or through a small telescope. 
uh, through binoculars. We'll get to see it like a phase, like we're seeing it here. It's uh, it's actually probably in a waxing gibbous phase right now, and that's not be it's it's not a circle because it is uh, it does go through phases just like our moon does. Uh, actually, Mercury and Venus are both the inferior planets, and both of those uh, uh, do the same thing. They they end up uh, appearing like this in our in our eyepiece. So we'll get to see through a waxing crescent phase, a gibbous phase, full moon or full phase um, at different times, uh, depending on how sunlight is reflecting off the planet, of course. So we're going to offer Venus here just for a few minutes while Mike uh, will get ready for his talk as well. I'm watching comments here coming in on both streams, and I guess we're, we're still doing okay. And I want to make sure that I mute my uh, volume over here. Coming in on both. Okay. Yep. And I lost my preview for my Facebook, but that's okay. All right. <laughs> this is interesting. <laughs> uh, oh. Daniel says, last night it was able to see Venus and uh, it's uh, half lit state. Yeah, so that's about what we're going to be seeing. Hi, Michael. Evening. So Venus is the second planet from the Sun and our closest planetary neighbor. It's similar in structure and size to the Earth. Um, the Venus actually spins slowly in the opposite direction from all the other planets. Uh, its thick atmosphere traps heat in a runaway greenhouse effect, making it the hottest planet in our solar system, um, with surface temperatures hot enough to melt lead. And uh, Glimpses below the clouds reveal volcanoes and deformed mountains. Venus is named for the ancient Roman goddess of love and beauty, who was known as Aphrodite to the ancient Greeks. In Roman mythology, Venus was the goddess of love, sex, beauty, and fertility. She was the Roman counterpart to the Greek Aphrodite. However, uh, Roman Venus had many abilities beyond the Greek Aphrodite. She was a goddess of victory as well as well as fertility and even prostitution. Huh. The things you learn. <laughs> <laughs> With a radius of about uh, 6,000 kilometers, Venus is roughly the same size as Earth. It's just slightly smaller. And from an average distance of about 108 million kilometers, Venus is 0.7 astronomical units away from the Sun. So we're one astronomical unit, of course, the distance from us to the Sun, so it's about 0.7. One astronomical unit is the distance from the Sun to the Earth. It takes a sunlight about uh, eight and a half minutes to travel, or six minutes actually, to travel from the Sun to Venus, where it takes eight and a half minutes for sunlight to travel from the Sun to us. Now, Venus's rotation and orbit are unusual in several ways. Venus is one of just two planets that rotate from east to west. Only Venus and Uranus have this backwards rotation. It completes one rotation in 243 Earth days, the longest day of any planet in our solar system. Hi Irene, welcome. I'm going to keep pausing for comments here to be sure that I'm still getting things coming in. And just bear with me folks, just uh, Trying to watch two feeds at once here is a little bit uh, more difficult than I had anticipated, but. You need bifocals. I do. <laughs> watch two screens. At, at least that much. <laughs> okay. And I think here we go. This is what I wanted to see. Okay, now I'm back to my Facebook. Come out with a brand new uh, live live feed. I want to. I want to. Trying to watch two feeds at once. There, we don't want to hear that. So yeah, we're coming up with a new uh, Facebook come up with a new uh, live feed um, format, which I'm not really happy with. So I try to flip back to the old one. Now I can see things uh, clearly, I guess. And there's Rob uh, logged in and heard the prostitution comment. <laughs> Robert said he heard the prostitution comment and wondered where the show had gone. <laughs> right to the dogs. Yes, that's right, Robert. All right. Um, Let's continue here. Uh, so uh, it completes one rotation in about 243 Earth days, the longest day of any planet in our solar system, uh, even longer than a whole year in Venus. 
but the sun doesn't rise and set each day on Venus like it does on most other planets. On Venus, a uh, one-day night cycle takes about uh, 117 Earth days because Venus rotates in the direction opposite of its orbital revolution around the sun. So I clicked on Mike here. I am. And uh, Paul. Hello. Hello. Hang on a second. I'm trying to find out why uh, we're not showing... Can you click on Mike as well? Uh, Mike. Uh, All you should see is Venus on me. There you go. I see Venus. Okay, you see Venus now? Yeah. I see Paul on YouTube. There's Venus. Hang There's on. Paul. All right. I see, it, I see it on YouTube okay. I'm just watching for it on Facebook. And I'll see you here next week in the romper room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, that was a tennis racket without strings all these years, right? <laughs> and Mike, you're sharing, you're sharing your screen at the moment. There we go. Okay, that's better. So, yeah, Paul, I guess uh, while Mike is talking or uh, whoever's doing the sharing, um, you'll need to be clicked on, on him as well. Whoever's I'll just leave it right where it is because I'm, yep. uh, I'm, I'm finding something. So I'll leave it right on my uh, – but you, am I on mic yet or no? You are on mic now. Yep, we see it. Do you want me to stay there or do you want me to go back Yeah, to no, you? that's perfect right there. Okay, not moving. <laughs> That's perfect. Just right where you are. <laughs> right where I be. Yeah. So yeah, where you're running OBS and I'm running OBS, I'm I'm feeding mine out to YouTube. Yours is going to Facebook. So uh, you'll need to be clicked on the same thing as what I'm clicked on, basically. Okay. Anyway, okay. Uh, anyway, we're still looking at Venus for all those who are joining in there. Wow, all kinds of people look like they're joining in. Perfect. <laughs> Uh, on Venus, one day night cycle takes about 117 Earth days because Venus rotates in the direction opposite of its orbital revolution around the Sun. So Venus makes a complete orbit around the Sun a year in Venusian time in 225 Earth days, or slightly less than two Venusian day-night cycles. Its orbit around the Sun is the most circular of any planet, nearly a perfect circle. Other planets' orbits are more elliptical or oval-shaped. With an axial tilt of just 3 degrees, Venus spins nearly upright, and so do, it does not experience any noticeable seasons. When the solar system settled into its current layout about 4.5 billion years ago, Venus formed when gravity pulled swirling gases and dust together to form the second planet from the Sun. Like its fellow terrestrial planets, Venus has a central core, a rocky mantle, and a solid crust. And for those who just joined on, we are showing Venus here live through the eyepiece, uh, from St. John uh, through Mike uh, Powell's telescope. We're going to uh, talk a little bit about how we're doing this too in a, in a moment or two. Venus is in many ways very similar to Earth in its structure. It has an iron core that is approximately 3,200 kilometers in radius. And above that is a mantle that's made of hot rock, slowly churning due to the planet's interior heat. The surface is a very thin crust of rock that bulges and moves as Venus mantles shifts and creates volcanoes. From space, Venus is very bright white because it's covered with clouds that reflect and scatter sunlight. At the surface, the rocks are different shades of gray, like rocks on Earth, but the thick atmosphere filters sunlight so that everything would look orange if you were standing on Venus. Venus has mountains, valleys, and tens of thousands of volcanoes. The highest mountain on Venus, Maxwell Montes, is 20,000 feet high similar to the highest mountain on Earth, Mount Everest. It is thought that Venus was completely resurfaced by volcanic activity 300 to 500 million years ago. Venus has two large highland areas, and uh, they're both about uh, the size of South America, straddling the equator and extending for about uh, 10,000 kilometers. And Venus is covered in craters, but none are smaller than 1.5 to 2 kilometers across. Small meteoroids burn up in the dense atmosphere, so only large meteoroids reach the surface and actually create impact craters because of uh, Venus's very thick atmosphere. Venus's atmosphere consists mostly of carbon dioxide with large clouds of sulfuric acid droplets, so it rains sulfuric acid on Venus. The thick atmosphere traps the sun's heat, resulting in surface temperatures higher than 470 degrees Celsius. The atmosphere has many layers with different temperatures. At the level where the clouds are, about 30 miles up from the surface, it's about the same temperature as it is on the surface of the Earth. 
So that's quite a change from 30 miles up to the same temperature as the Earth down to 470 degrees on the surface of Venus. As Venus moves forward in its solar orbit while slowly rotating backwards on its axis, the top level of clouds zips around the planet every four Earth days, driven by hurricane force winds traveling at about 360 kilometers per hour. Atmospheric lightning bursts light up these quick moving clouds. Speeds within the clouds decrease with cloud height, and at the surface they're estimated to be just about a few miles per hour. If you're standing on the ground on Venus, it would look like a very hazy, overcast day on Earth, and the atmosphere is so heavy, it would actually feel like you were one mile deep underwater. No human has ever visited Venus, but the spacecraft that have been sent to the surface of Venus do not last very long. Venus's high surface temperatures overheat the electronics in the spacecraft in a very short time. So it seems unlikely that a person would survive for very long on the Venusian surface. There is speculation about life existing in Venus's distant past, though, as well as questions about the possibility of life in the top cloud layers that are surrounding Venus, where the temperatures are less extreme. <coughs> Excuse me. That's all I get to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> So oh, that, was, that was plenty. Very beautiful, very pretty in our night sky, of course. But uh, what ends up happening is that uh, we don't really. Um, the reason why it's so pretty and bright is because it's, it has uh, very thick clouds of carbon dioxide. It rains sulfuric acid on Venus. The temperature on the surface is 470 degrees Celsius. The pressure on top of your head would be the same as standing one mile below the ocean. Wow. Um, it rains sulfuric acid, uh, it's covered with volcanoes, uh, most of the uh, craters on the planet are anywhere from one and a half to two kilometers in diameter, so this is a greenhouse uh, effect planet. Uh, there was, there is belief that uh, at one time there were actually oceans on, on Venus, uh, but because of the fact that the, these uh, clouds of carbon dioxide have surrounded it and created this large blanket around the planet that... Uh, the sun rays can't get back out again once they once they enter the atmosphere. Most of them can't get back out. But it does reflect about 97% of its light back out into space, so that's why it appears so bright in our sky. So again, Venus is the third brightest object in our sky behind the sun and the moon. Only Venus is uh, is, is brighter than all the other planets. So, And uh, only the moon and, and sun are brighter. And actually, if you are... If you have good eyes and, and a, maybe a pair of binoculars, you can actually pick out Venus in the daytime sky if you know exactly where to look for it. Now, some of our buddies uh, like Curtin have been able to pop, pick that out pretty easily. But uh, So there. I'd say that's uh, that's, that's enough Venus. on Venus. That's Venus, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sean, Sean said uh, he shared the post. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate that. Yeah, thanks, Sean. And we're seeing it on Facebook. That's great. Yep, everything looks good, I think. I'm on both feeds and getting dizzy, <laughs> Peter says. Yeah, I'm, I'm watching Facebook now, Chris, and uh, I can see everything. Everything's looking fine. Great. Okay, perfect. Yeah. As long yeah, as so, you see a dot in the middle of the screen, we're doing good. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah we can see that dot. Darcy B. We're seeing it on both screens. Perfect. Okay, so, Mike, uh, we could probably drop out of that one if you want. All righty. And uh, nip out here. We'll get you back. Let, to, me, uh, let me unshare for a second. Okay. There he is. Hey, Mike. We'll drop the hey, welcome he back. There. Yeah. Hey, there. I'll take care of that. So as we get to, yeah. to Paul's uh, uh, point, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how we're doing this, how we're live stacking, and how we're offering these views uh, through our eyepiece. So maybe, Mike, uh, when you get an opportunity, if you have a picture of your observatory, we might bring it up. Uh, inside or outside? <laughs> uh, yeah, the outside. You have the outside one? Uh, no. No, okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, the inside of the, yeah, the inside of the observatory is what I was referring yeah. to, sorry. Yeah. We got, like you guys, I got 15 screens on the go here. Come on up. There we go. Yeah, Irene Beautiful. says, the only sad thing is that if you're on YouTube, you can't see the comments that are coming in on Facebook and vice versa. And that's why I'm here, Irene, trying to answer questions on both sides of the house here. So, um, I'm going to try to watch both screens. Yeah, it is unfortunate that we can't, uh. You can't be on both at the same time, but you could be, I guess. 
Hey, Paul Owen joined. There we go. <laughs> Facebook. Hey, there we go. Yeah, and I'll, I'll answer some of the questions on Facebook as we're going. But during Mike's talk, if you want to handle it, that's fine. You bet. Okay. Thanks, Paul. You can Paul. see it's uh, still sunny light outside. So this yeah, is an ever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, very light. So this is the inside of your observatory, Mike. And maybe you could yeah, just uh, really give us a little bit part. of what you got there for gear. Well, uh, as I posted the other day on Facebook, he kind of looks like Wally. If anybody ever saw the movie, uh, the three scopes here running across the top. I've got uh, an 80 millimeter acro that I'd use with an eyepiece that just centers the object in the eyepiece, so I know when I'm on it. The center scope here in the middle is the one that was on Venus. It's a 50 millimeter guide scope with an Altair 224 camera in it. Uh, using that as my guide scope. And the one on the outer edge here on this side is a William Optic 66 SD APO. And uh, I've got a Canon DSLR camera shoved in the back of that for doing my astrophotography. All of that sits on a C-Gem mount and uh, on a pedestal that's uh, 48 inches tall. I wanted to make it so that it would uh, I could shoot over the roof. The walls are six foot six. Mm. And the only reason I built my observatory that way because i wanted it to look like a regular shed in the backyard so the roof is, pitch, is, is a pitched roof and it rolls off right mike yeah yeah and uh when the neighbors see it i just tell them i bought the plans in newfoundland and i roll the roof off to use it over the barbecue there you go <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah, so it is pretty, it's a pretty neat setup and this is this is pretty common now that these roll off roofs so you uh you put a set of casters basically on a couple of uh, angle iron uh, pieces that are attached to the roof, and it slides uh, slides the roof right off. So and then you slide it up when yeah, you're done. Yeah, they were uh, they're V casters that you purchase for uh, warehouse shelving, uh, where they you know they can take large monstrous pieces of shelving and just roll them across the floor on pieces of angle iron. There's very little uh, friction there, so they move relatively easy. I have two pieces of two by two angle iron across each side on the top, and I use ten of those V casters, five on each side. Right. My roof weighs, unfortunately, about nine hundred pounds because it's a full shingle roof. Yeah. Uh, I might go to something lighter this summer. I don't know yet, but for yeah. now, it works. Okay. So, perfect. That's my setup. Where are you? You're there still? Uh, who me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Gotcha. <laughs> Thought yeah. I lost your volume. Up. All well, right. No worries. I'll. Uh, just drop this down, and you should see. There's the double cluster. Screen. And I'll pull up this. There we go. So this is something that uh, I thought I'd do a quick talk on my MacGyver talk tonight. Uh, I got two portions. One is kind of listening to Jupiter, and the other one is called uh, How to Build an Itty Bitty Radio Telescope. So listening to Jupiter, Jupiter is a, a very uh, powerful source of natural radio waves. Uh, you can pick up those signals using a ham radio or short wave radio, and it's actually a pretty easy thing to do. Uh, as you can see, there's a magnetic field around Jupiter, waves around. And anytime you have an electromagnetic source, you have basically a speaker or a microphone. So where does the radio signal get all its power? Well, it starts with uh, Jupiter's volcanic moon, Io. The tidal forces that Jupiter had the large satellite superheat the interior of the moon, and it makes it the most volcanic body in the solar system. The material thrown up from the surface of Jupiter in uh, huge gaseous clouds, and there's a lot of metal in that. And as that spins around, it creates an electromagnetic field, and you'll find out that Jupiter actually puts out about 2 trillion watts of electromagnetic power. That's an awful lot of power. <laughs> and it's all DC. It's the biggest DC electrical uh, circuit in the solar system. So the current and the power from the plasma waves will rise to radio signals and travel from Jupiter's magnetic poles into a cone shape of beams. The beam rotates as the giant planet ro rotates every 9 hours, 55 minutes, making Jupiter like a slowly turning pulsar. When the beams sweep past our planet Earth, listeners can pick up the Jovian bursts with, uh, with a radio and the bands between 15 and 40 megahertz. That's where you can get a shortwave radio or a ham radio. You can get down into that frequency. And you can see in this particular one, as IO comes around, 
there's the cone. And you can see the earth on the right hand side. And you can see the, the cone that of sound that's put out from Jupiter. And it's pretty neat. So what you have to do is make sure that you uh, are going to listen to it while Io is in the right spot. And we'll get to another slide that will quickly explain that. You have to bear with me. I'm going to trip over my tongue a little bit. I've been awake since 3 o'clock in the morning and I worked all day. So. so what do you need to listen to Jupiter? Well, you need a ham radio or a shortwave radio. There's lots of shortwave radios still kicking around out there. Uh, or any ham guys obviously already have the equipment. Uh, you can buy still uh, shortwave radios. I saw one at Value Village the other day, and it was uh, 6 bucks. And uh, it took a set of AA batteries, and away it went. The only thing I could hear on it was AM, but it's still a shortwave radio. And it's nice to have some kind of a spectrum analyzer software if you're going to plug this system into a laptop or computer in order to pick up the sounds. So you'll also need some sky charting software because you want to be able to track where Io and Jupiter are to make sure that your timing is right and Io is coming around in between Jupiter and the Earth. And that's, <coughs> excuse me. That's where you get that cone of influence. So if you have a ham radio or a shortwave radio, uh, it's really very simple. All you have to do is connect the speaker out or the earphone jack out to the sound card in on your laptop. And then you pull up your spectrum analyzer software and turn on the radio, tune it into a frequency somewhere around 14, uh, 1480 megahertz and start listening to the static. And your, your spectrum analyzer software will automatically pick up that you've plugged in from the uh, radio out or the speaker out on your radio and into the input of the sound card on your computer. For an antenna, basically all you need is a very large dipole. Now you can run it out the window and you can run a long wire across your backyard. Uh, the longer the wire, the better the signal you're going to pick up. Spectrum Analyzer software is uh, see not only here, but you can see uh, what the sounds are doing. It's uh, just a waterfall graph, and uh, as the sound moves across, you see the changes in colors and changes in movements and the waterfall, uh, and it's really cool, really neat to watch. There's another program you can download if you wanted to take over a large span of time. It's basically a data collecting software, and it's called Radio Skypipe. Uh, I can't remember what the cost is, but it's not very much. Uh, I downloaded it about four years ago, and I can't remember what I paid for it. But uh, the software lasts forever. And you can actually use that software and join in with other people on the net and see what they're listening to if they're listening to Jupiter at the same time and picking up the same stuff that you're picking up on the same frequency, which is kind of pretty cool. So when you are listening you want to pick a frequency between 18 megahertz and 28 megahertz i said 14 didn't i earlier so i i misled you there between 18 and 28 megahertz and then you sit and listen and what you're listening for is just a change in the static because it, it's not going to be this uh, wonderful beautiful music right off the bat that we produce here on earth you know it's just going to be a change in the static noise of the radio there's a setup that I originally started with. It's the ham radio setup. Uh, when I'm not showing a presentation, you can probably see it set up behind me here in the chair. And what are you listening for? There's two sounds that you can get off of Jupiter. One is called an L burst. <coughs> the L burst, if you're listening closely, actually sounds like waves crashing on a pebble beach. And it's very, very noticeable. It's, it's very rhythmic. And so it's not just the static, all of a sudden you'll hear the static sounding and use your imagination and you hear those, uh, the pebble beach and the waves rolling across the pebbles. The second sound that you listen for is called an S burst. And it's kind of like swirls or it sounds like whale song, which is really, really cool. So here you are thinking that there's no sounds out there, but with a simple ham or a ham radio or a simple uh, short wave radio, you can actually sit and listen to these S-bursts that sound like whale song coming from Jupiter, and it's really cool when you do finally pick one up. But uh, it takes a lot of patience, and you're sitting there listening to a lot of static in the background. But the best part is it doesn't have to be a beautiful, clear night with a telescope. You can do it any time or day and night, rain, fog, as long as they're not lightning around, because the lightning is going to obviously add to your static. But uh, on a foggy day or a foggy night or a cloudy night, you can still sit and 
tinker around and listen to Jupiter. So you've basically invented with a, a small uh, shortwave radio, you made yourself uh, a ground-based radio telescope, which is really pretty cool. So again, Jupiter can be heard day and night, doesn't matter. You can use the same setup to actually listen to the sun. And what you're listening to is you'll hear the burst in the static. When there's an electromagnetic uh, wave or a, even a, what do they call them that come off the side? The uh, solar flare? Um, Mass ejections or solar flares. Yep. You will hear the difference in, in static and you'll pick it up on your radio. And it's just something if you got nothing better to do, get yourself a, a shortwave radio connected to a, a laptop via a simple, you know, a earphone jack cord. And uh, you can listen to it, listen to the static and listen for the, the difference in the static. And you can record it on, on uh, spectrum analyzer software. It's cheap, it's easy, and it's kind of fun to do. And that's all I got for that little portion of it. <laughs> like the last slide. Yeah. <clears throat> Let me get this out of the way, and I'll switch to something else here. Uh, okay, I won't get rid of that. Now. Yeah, so Rob was asking me, whether we're going to be able to listen to that tonight. I, I, we're not, we weren't set up for that tonight, Rob. Um, no. Yeah, so. We definitely um, weren't. But maybe sometime down the road when, when we've got. Oh, yeah. uh, We've got Jupiter and Io in the right uh, right position. We'll we'll try to offer that in a future night. We'll take we'll a, a case of beer. We'll yeah. sit down and we'll, <laughs> we'll That's all it takes. <laughs> we'll see even, what I get. We'll even Let's fake see. it for that. All right. So the second little part I wanted to talk about is actually pretty cool. You can see it here just behind me. It's the uh, IBRT, which stands for the Itty Bitty Radio Telescope. Uh, when we go to star parties and things during the daytime, uh, you know, uh, there's some solar scopes around, but the solar scopes aren't the cheapest thing in the world to get your hands on. You know, it's, your, it's an investment like anything else. And I figure if there's already three or four solar scopes at the, at the star party or at the events that we're at, I really don't need one. But it would be nice to have something different and be nice to be able to do something different that would still uh, have people interested in what's going on. Uh, without necessarily even looking through a white light filter or a solar scope. So I got reading online, and I come across this thing that the, it's literally the, the article was called the Itty Bitty Radio Telescope, and uh, it's taking an old Bell satellite dish or any old satellite dish you can get your hands on. Uh, you know, if, uh, this one here I kind of ripped off my sister's roof. And... Uh, you know, it, it, there's very, very little or no modifications to do to it. The only thing I did is on the arm that comes out here, this way, I hooked the Vixen dovetail to the bottom, and so I mounted it on a, an EQ3 tripod, and that just allows me to have an equatorial mount that I can actually move the satellite dish around on. Now, the the regular front, the regular LMB is a signal that, uh, or the piece that picks up the signal, uh, wherever your radio source is coming from, the sun is a very big one. It comes in and it'll reflect off the dish up to the LMB. This particular LMB has two coaxial uh, connections on it. One is uh, the one that you're going to take and you hook a satellite finder that you would normally use if you were going to tune your satellite dish to watch satellite TV. It's the same, uh, same satellite finder. And you plug your one coaxial cable into one side of that. On the other side, if you're using it for satellite discs for TV, uh, you would plug in. It already has a built-in power source. In our case, since we don't have a power source, we're just using the dish. The LMB runs off 18 volts. So if you are wanted to be portable out at a star party or something like that in order to make it work, uh, I put two 9-volt batteries together in series, and that gives me the 18 volts, and that's all the power I need to run the satellite finder. Or uh, in, in another case that I have set up, I bought a 12-volt uh, inverter. It's 12-volt to 18-volt to from my laptop, and uh, I plug that into the side, and that gives me the power I need to run the actual satellite finder. So you take the satellite dish, you run one coaxial cable to the satellite finder, and as you rotate the dish towards the sun, you will notice the needle come up. Now, if you're away from the sun and the needle comes up, you might be picking up a satellite that's transmitting. But, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're pointed directly at the sun, 
the needle on the satellite finder will pin itself all the way over on the far side. And if there's solar flares and things, you can actually watch the needle move back and forth on, on this little satellite finder. Now, I kind of went one step further. <laughs> I took really? the other coaxial. <laughs> the other coaxial Surprises me. <laughs> yeah. The other coaxial connection that comes off the LNB, I ran a second cable down, and that plugs into, I'll just pull it up here. Plugs into something called, uh, oh, what is this? They're uh, a radio dongle that you can buy on eBay. Uh, and what it does is it converts the signal from the dish and plugs it in so you can use software. If I can get this back in again. Get in there. He cooperated before. <laughs> okay. So it's called an SDR radio dongle, which stands for Software Defined Radio. They run about 20 bucks. And what that Software Defined Radio dongle does is it converts the signal from the satellite dish and puts it onto a waterfall graph on your laptop or computer. And I don't know if you can see it very well here. I'll stop and start again. But it has a strength meter on the side here. It tells you how strong the signal is coming from. It's tuned into 1.2 gigahertz in order to pick up the signal from the sun. So it's at the high end of the uh, satellite dish frequency range. And then as there's solar flares or something that come off the sun, that the electromagnetic signal is going to be picked up by the dish down to the software-defined radio dongle and then up onto the software, and you will actually see peaks and waves and movement uh, on the waterfall on your screen, and you can tell when there's a solar flare going on. If someone's looking at it in the telescope and seeing it, you're watching it on the waterfall software, and it's just a really cool different thing to show people when you're at a star party or something like that during the daytime it's not necessarily visual you've got yourself a miniature radio telescope that you can actually listen to the sun and uh you know they can watch through the eyepiece and they can listen to it at the same time and see what's going on so it's a, it's a really cool interesting uh point of talk when people are walking around going what you got going on there and of course they see the satellite discs they're wondering if you're watching movies or something like that you go no man i'm listening to the sun Right. <laughs> so, it, it's a simple setup. All you need is a, a any old satellite dish, some coaxial cable, uh, two nine volt batteries that plug into the uh, the satellite finder, an SDR radio dongle. Which, if you go on eBay and type in SDR for software defined radio dongle, you can buy one for twenty bucks, right on up to two thousand bucks, depending on how much you want to spend. Uh, this little one that I got plugs into a USB port on the side, and it runs. It sells for twenty dollars, and then uh, you can download the HDR software for free, which gives you the waterfall, and you can watch the signals coming in from the dish to the radio and onto your computer screen. So, it's a it's a simple, cool little setup to do, and uh, it creates a lot of interest to start parties. So absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> the part I like is everybody else is out there with an optical telescope and they got an eyepiece and they're looking through a telescope and Mike is sitting there with his radio dish. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you got to have something to catch people's attention, right? Yeah, you sure do. <laughs> yeah, that's never that's never a problem for you. <laughs> now it's funny. Somebody came to me and asked, you know, uh, when when you use a telescope and stuff, you use a solar finder to find the sun. They said, "How do you find the sun with a with a satellite dish?" And uh, I basically have a magnet. I stick it in the center, <laughs> and it looks like a what do you call them sundial? And yeah. then you just move the scope until the dot is in the middle and not a line on the on the side of the dish anymore. And guess what? You're lined up on the sun, so it's pretty easy to, to get it lined up. <laughs> Radio astronomy. <laughs> yeah. So cool. And and again, you, you can use this. You can do this in the daytime, uh, or in yeah. I mean, you can do it in, in really. As long as it's cloudy, not raining, I guess, but 
No, you can't uh, have training as long as you're under the tent and you're not getting wet. Doesn't matter yeah. if the dish does or not. But yeah, it's a, like I said, it makes for a great conversation piece. Absolutely, sure does. As everything does here. <laughs> 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 a little alien sitting behind you, and the Apollo Saturn rocket up behind you, and yeah, great spot. So, anybody that might be interested in it, uh, it's it literally called the Itty Bitty Radio Telescope. And type that into Google, and you'll see a page come up called stargazing.net. You click on that website, and it tells you exactly from start to finish how to rip it off the, the roof of your neighbor's house and build it and hide it in your own garage and make it all work. So <laughs> Nice. <laughs> Amazing stuff. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, no problem. Wow. Never get, uh, never get bored with those talks. <laughs> Just me being me. <laughs> All right. Um, now let me see if I can get to. Uh, maybe I'll I'll start with a few photos next. Uh, we did have some photos uh, contributed to the page, uh, so maybe I'll I'll uh, try sharing them. Paul, are you, you're still out there. I'm here. All right. We're gonna see if uh, if I share my screen now. And we'll make sure that that uh, gets shared out on Facebook at the same time here. And I want to take a look. Everybody. Hey, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I got to find out where my pictures went. Just a second. Might have to minimize this for a second and pull them up. Uh, they're in here somewhere. Maybe what I'll do is I'll go to Paul instead. And uh, I want to go back to Mike here. Here we go. Uh, Paul, maybe we'll go back to you first of all, and we'll do our, our uh, Rosanna thing while I try to find my uh, my photos. Okay. There, if you're ready for that. You guys are doing that. I'll go to the observatory and spin this sucker around so we can't get an object for you. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thanks, Mike. Well, I'm going to stop sharing. And I'm going to flip on to you there, Paul. Oh, oh. oh. I, I'm I'm doing the funny thing. You are. I am. So let me uh, see if I can get out of that now. Just minimize that one. Okay. That was, that was just your OBS, right, popping up. So. Okay. Yeah. Every time I put it on me, uh, it just goes way in the background there. So. Want to share? Let me stop sharing. And uh, let me see if I just bring it up here. If I put this up on my screen, can you see that? No, I can see just you at the moment. Let me give it a second, I guess. There we go. There's you. I'm just looking at your Facebook feed here. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you're just falling in the back. Let me try and put it on another screen. See if that'll work. Just bear with us there, folks. We're trying to get the, the Facebook uh, part of it. There we are. We see Rosanna's fun fact up there now. Yeah, that's on because I'm on the other screen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so, OBS, OBS and that one has to be on the same screen. No, they're on it? different screens now. Yeah. Anyway, it doesn't matter. We'll deal with that later. So um, so this is, you got your, your music ready? I, I Well, just a second. I'm going to cue it in, but we're not getting it on YouTube. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So the Rosanna's fun fact isn't going to show up on YouTube that way. Oh, well, there. I'll, well, uh, there. Technical glitch, folks. Please stand by. <laughs> we need some elevator music. Yeah. See, I've got it queued up here, but if I if I uh, go to share my screen, um, I'm going to just go into that vortex. With OBS is minimized, though, is it? Yeah, I think it is. Uh, yeah, it sure is. It's minimized, yeah. okay. Let's try one more time. Okay. You should try sharing again. We'll see what happens. Uh, okay, this is the one I want to share right here. Cancel that. And share. Screen one. There you are. 
You know, I'll see if I can find. <laughs> I can't find Rowan okay. Tana. Nope. You Tana. had a pit. You had a picture there. Yeah, that was on the other screen, and I put it back on this screen. And let's see if I can do it this way. Yeah, this is. There we go. Is that up? Okay, it's up. It's up on mine. Yep. Yeah. And uh, let me see if you click on yourself. On hang on, just we'll see if it comes up on Facebook. Just leave things alone. Just one second. Beep. Uh, I think it's going to come up. <laughs> da, 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 da. Yep, it's coming up on Facebook uh, right in the moment. There it comes. Oh, and this fun fact. Oh, so we need there, some music. Oh, there it is. I, okay. I, missed, I missed my cue. Hang on a second. Okay. And now... Rosanna's Fun Fact. All thanks, right, well, we had a hard again. time getting Rosanna coming up here today, but we finally got through, and there she is. There she is. Hey, Rosanna. And uh, so let's get right into Rosanna's fun facts for this week. So this is what Rosanna wrote us this week, and I found this to be kind of timely. I'm really kind of glad she wrote this, uh, gave us this little fun fact. So she says, uh, since uh, my normally hectic work life schedule has ground to a halt, there is some isolation time to dwell on uh, what space travel to Mars might involve. And I think that's kind of the same for all of us. Uh, a one-way trip to Mars will take about nine months, which is a long time to spend inside a hermetically sealed tube hurtling through a cold, dark void. So suddenly the quarantines, the suspension of our normal routines doesn't seem all that bad, does it? <laughs> uh, many scientists studying the details of sending humans to Mars believe that the boredom is one of the most serious challenges. Uh, much of the boredom will be around what food an astronaut can eat and the very human ritual of eating all while dealing with the realities of space flight. So far, even though as what, um, excuse me, having a space station that costs a gazillion dollars built by engineers that can build most amazing things, the food warmer is a briefcase that takes about 20 minutes, and it only fits enough food for three people at a time. So it's not really satisfactory. So never mind the fact that the lack of gravity causes fluids to pool into your head, causing a condition known as space face, <laughs> like that, <laughs> which besides uh, causing some irreversible vision issues, it also means that for most eating in orbit, it's like eating uh, with a severe head cold. So astronauts crave stronger tastes that will cut through the congestion. Scott Kelly, who had never ate desserts on Earth, became a chocoholic during his year on the ISS. <laughs> so um, in light of that, this gal right here, her name is Maggie Koblenz and from the Space Exploration Initiative. And Maggie is a research specialist. Um, and she heads uh, the head, she's the head of food research. And among, among many of her initiatives, she has created a special helmet for eating in zero gravity. So what you're looking at here is not a cartoon. It's actually her inside of her, inside of this, this helmet. So the helmet she's created, that she has created acts like, uh, almost like a noise canceling headphones, allowing an astronaut to focus on just eating. She can pipe in a soundtrack for frying onions and open a canister releasing match scent to increase the appetite and salvation. This helmet was recently, um, salivation, sorry. This helmet was recently tested on an anti-gravity flight by a zero G gravity corporation. And it had a built-in lazy Susan on it, which Maggie had mounted five small containers. So you can see those containers right in front of her there. Uh, Boba pearls and pop rocks were two of the choices. Now, the helmet catches all the crumbs as crumbs left to their own devices floating around in a spaceship can uh, end, uh, end up causing havoc in the equipment. Since liquids are known to behave particularly, are peculiarly, peculiar, no, weird word, peculiarly, <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm on a space flight myself. Aluminum. In microgravity, uh, Maggie created a special um, spherification station where she can inject a bead of ginger ex extract into a lemon flavored bubble, creating uh, multi pop sensations. Um, yeah, that will float rather than sit on a plate. 
This trick is to capture, then the trick is to capture these tasty little spheres. Many of the Pop Rocks went up her nose during the test flight. <laughs> <laughs> Personally, I think it'll, um, I think we'll, um, we'll ever be more grateful to stick to, oh, this is, this is from true, from uh, Rosanna. And for those people at the St. John Astronomy Club, we'll know, you'll, you'll get this. So she says, personally, I think we'll be more ever grateful to stick to the savoring of Trudy's and Yolanda's detectable treats provided <laughs> in full gravity during the break at the St. John Astronomy Club when they resume. <laughs> so if Absolutely. you want to read more about this, it's in Wired Magazine in the March issue, and the article is by Nicola Twilley. And that is this week's Rosanna's... Rosanna's fun fact. <laughs> Rosanna's fun facts for this week. Let's see what and there you go. So I have to hold my cell phone up to the to the uh, to the piece here, you know, my microphone, because you can't play uh, Google. Uh, you can't play sounds on Google Hangouts. So that's yeah. a, it's a little bit. But thanks, Peter, again, Peter uh, Visma, there for for throwing us those. Uh, those uh, little clips there. That's great to, to add them off. And thank you, Rosanna, for that great uh, information on, yeah, trying to eat that stuff. And imagine that going up your nose. <laughs> yeah. A lazy Susan built around your head in a spaceship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. <clears throat> the things you have to do to, to get to space, eh? That's it. Yeah. So, okay, um, maybe uh, you can continue sharing just for a second, Paul. I'm going to I'm going to try to minimize your screen or exit the full screen for a second to see if I can get my my photos up here. And I'm not sure where I put them all. Oh, here's one of them. Let's try to bring up a few photos that were dropped off to me um, through... Let's uh, see if I can get them up here first of all. Oh, it's going to pop up on that screen, of course. And I'm going to drop this one up as well. And I had a couple more here. This one and this one. And this one, this one, and I think this one, and that one. Here, okay. Now, I think I can get them switched over, so let's try this over here. And am I sharing my screen yet? No, I'm not. Second, I'll share my screen. So, Paul, yeah, if I share my screen, Paul, maybe you can click on me at the same time once I click share. Gotcha. And that should be a picture of you right now. Hey, look at you. Look at that. And you know what? We finished the same as everybody else did this year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> yeah, even Toronto. <laughs> All right, so let's uh, let's see if I can get some pictures up here. I'm going to try to bring this over again. So let's see what happens here. I'm going to bring this over to the side. And... We'll see if we can see that. Yes, see I see all your pictures of the clips. Okay, so let's see if we get it up on Facebook too. Are you still clicked on me? Yep, so we should get it up there too. Just a sec. Yeah, there's just a little bit of there. Yeah, a little bit of lag on Facebook. So, there. Anyway, okay, we can continue talking, I guess, about that one. So, that's uh, Trudy sent me this one, Trudy Allman. Um, the solar eclipse of August 21st, 2017, when she was over in PEI, and uh, she captured this nice. Uh, Nice captures there. Nice big yeah. bite. Of, nice big bite of the sun. Uh, of course, it was only a partial eclipse from here in St. John and from uh, Prince Edward Island as well, I guess. But uh, very nice capture. Thanks, uh, Trudy, for sending that into us. Uh, we do have one coming up on June the tenth, June the tenth of 2021. It's just next year, just a little bit over a year now. When we'll have one here in St. John, that's going to be about 80 percent, 85 percent or so. Uh, so and it's going to uh, it's going to appear in our early morning sky. So as the sun rises in the morning, we're going to see the sun uh, beginning to be eclipsed just as it breaks the, the horizon, and it'll last about uh, a little over an hour and a half, I guess, altogether. Uh, but yeah, we're going to get about an 85 or so percent, each 87 percent uh, eclipse here before our big one that comes up on 2024, uh, which is of course our total solar eclipse. Uh, uh, not from here in St. John. St. John, we're going to get about 98.5%, 99%, which is really, wow. But you want to be just north of Fredericton or in Fredericton, actually, and a little bit north of Fredericton, uh, right up to about the Miramichi, where you're going to get uh, totality. And the farther east you go um, in the province, 
like out around Kujipakrak actually would be about the best. You're going to get about three minutes, a little over three minutes of totality up there. So, um, and that one happens on April the 8th of 2024. Now, April the 8th, you know, this year we're doing pretty good for weather wise, but hard mm-hmm. to say if we'd be into a snowstorm or what on April the 8th on, on, in, uh, three more years, but, or four more years, but that's really only four years away. And, uh, Really, this province has to start uh, making plans uh, for this type of an event. I know that we're into the social distancing at this time, but I, I surely expect we'll be out of it by that time. Um, but there, there's an, an event here that's coming up that would attract a lot of tourists to the province. Um, we can see how, how big the, the Great American Eclipse was there in 2017 uh, across the U.S. So the same thing is going to happen here. It's going to come up uh, the uh, northeastern seaboard and run right through New Brunswick. Uh, so we're going to have an opportunity from St. John right up to uh, almost to, uh, well, to Campbellton, you'll still have uh, a part part of you, sure, but from St. John up to uh, Fredericton, and then from Fredericton up is going to give you your best view. So uh, if you have the opportunity to get out and see that one, uh, you, you usually only get a chance to see one or maybe two in your whole lifetime. And there really isn't anything like it uh, as far as totality goes. I haven't quite experienced a complete totality myself, but... There was one back when I was a little kid, I remember, and I was quite scared, I think, at the time, too, because I think I was only five years old or so. But those kind of things scare you when you're five. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> this is a great shot from Trudy. So thanks for sharing that, Trudy. So this gives us a reminder of what we're going to get uh, next year on June the 10th, but it'll be actually uh, more than this. And maybe by that time, too, we'll be coming out of this uh, this lull that we're having right now with the sun, this too, uh, Pauly. So we might have a few sunspots yeah. uh, as well, maybe at this time. We are in the solar minimum right now, but we are st- slowly getting out of it. There's the odd sunspot that does appear. Uh, for a few days and then disappears again, but they are from the solar cycle 25. We are finishing solar cycle 24. Um, so they are from the new cycle, which means that uh, when we do run through an 11 year cycle on the sun, um, every five and a half years, it's quite active. And then five and a half years uh, below that, it gets very low. So we've been going through this experience right now with very few sunspots on the sun. Now, it doesn't mean that there's not a whole lot of activity still happening with the sun. We still have the solar prominences, solar flares, uh, coronal mass ejections, things like that still happen, of course. But uh, sunspots are, are, are more or less rare right now. But they will start to appear more uh, as we move forward. Well, that's one shot. Um, let me see what else I got here. Uh, do, 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 do. I don't know if they're going to appear or not. Oh, they're not going to. Hang on. Okay, I'll bring them over. But before I get into this, yeah, I haven't got these quite in order, but I'll, I'll be bringing them up. So here's here's Venus in our, east, our, our western sky for the next little while. So we can see there's, uh, there's the orbit of Venus. And uh, Venus is almost at the very, I'll call it the top of its orbit, really, but it's this is the ecliptic line. This is the path that the planets uh, tend to take across the sky in our evening sky, really high this time of year. Um, in the summertime, they'll be really low uh, in, the, in the evening sky. So we can see Venus is very high there. So we've got a lot of time before that drifts down to sunset. Uh, so this is looking west at about 8.30 local time, your time, doesn't matter where you are. Um, and this is where Venus would appear. So we're coming up to on the 24th now. We would be uh, at the maximum eastern elongation. That's as far east as it's going to drift in the sky before it starts to, to whirl back down around the other way again. And it'll, it'll end up between us and the sun um, sometime in July, I think it is, June or July. So we still got some time to, to pick it up. It's actually, once it gets up past the top here, it's going to drift pretty quickly down the other side. So we do have it uh, in our sky probably till about May or so. So get out and take a look at it. Uh, take a pair of binoculars, take a quick look at it, and you'd be surprised at what you'll be able to see with it. Let's see what else we got. Oh, here's one. Okay, so here's one from Brad, from Brad Craft. Oh, nice. Isn't that nice? Beautiful. So that's uh, that's our sunrise this morning, apparently, from St. Cyrus Beach, which is my... Wow, that's my, fantastic. That's my little spot. Yep, beautiful. So look at the sunrise coming up over here, and here he's got uh, Jupiter, and there's Mars. Can you see my pointer, Paul? Or? Yep. Yep, okay. So we've got sure. bright Jupiter there. That's the, the brightest one. And then we have Mars down below it, and then we have Saturn off here to the side, to the left. So very faint out there because of the fact that the sun is rising, of course, and we're losing some of it. Now, Mercury would be right down there, very close to the horizon. And it just breaks the horizon just as sunrise is coming up like this. So it's very difficult to pick out. 
And Mercury never really drifts very far from the sun. It only takes 88 days to go around the sun. So it doesn't get out very far in its orbit before it starts to whip back around the other way again. So there is a, there is a brief time that we're able to pick up Mercury in, the, in our morning sky, usually in the winter time, a little bit better. But uh, here we are with the three planets lined up. So what's going to happen now is that we've got Jupiter, Mars, and Saturn. And Mars is going to be drifting this way, eastern uh, in our sky. So it's going to appear uh, back here in about another, well, week or so, two weeks, I guess. So we'll have Mars, Saturn, and Jupiter lined up. So we still have the nice morning dance of the planets here uh, over the next few weeks for sure. So get out in the morning sky if you're not, uh, if you are an early riser. You know, early bird gets a worm kind of thing. Early bird gets a planet in, these, in this case. <laughs> Um, take a look at, at Jupiter with a pair of binoculars, you'll get to see a few moons beside it. So uh, it's a really nice bright uh, bright ball, and you'll see little tiny dots all around it that look like stars, but they're actually moons. Sometimes you'll see all four over this side, and sometimes the four will be on the other side, maybe two and two. Sometimes you only see three because one's in behind or one's in front. But it's a little mini solar system. Saturn, um, Jupiter has 79 moons altogether that we found so far. Uh, of course, Mars has two moons, Phobos and Deimos, which we can't really pick out really from Earth, I don't think. I haven't never seen them myself. But uh, And Saturn has uh, 82 moons, which we can pick up through the telescope, uh, at least the larger ones, Dion and, and uh, Tethys and uh, Titan, I guess. Of course, the magnificent ring system, too, around Saturn, which can be witnessed uh, through, uh, through a set of binoculars. It's going to appear like an oblong kind of planet. You're really not going to see the definition in the rings. But something from, say, a uh, four-inch Paul, I guess, four-inch uh, reflector and up, mm -hmm. you'd probably be able to see the, the rings of, of Saturn through that. So yeah. So always fascinating to see uh, Saturn in the night sky, or in the morning sky, in this case. So what's going to happen with these now, again, is these are going to stay up in our morning sky, and then as we get closer to summer, they're going to be in our evening sky, uh, right to the right of this picture here, which is brings us into the south area. So here from St. Rest Beach, this is just outside the Irving Nature Park in St. John. And uh, we're looking back over uh, Thumb Island. This is Thumb Island right there. And I think that one's called Manawaganish Island, maybe. Not quite sure. But out past that, of course, is Nova Scotia. So uh, really nice view. Um, this is my typical uh, evening view if I'm d set up down there at Saints Rest. I really do miss the place. <laughs> and it might be a little while before I get back down there again, I guess. But uh, it is a beautiful spot to in, in, within city limits to be able to enjoy uh, a nice uh, evening sky. For sure. And a morning sky. Here you go. So so get out uh, in the morning sky and pick up these ones if you like. And uh, if you've got extra time in your hands and you're in your home now, uh, working from home or doing your social distancing thing, you've got an opportunity to get down and take a look. And uh, of course, in our evening sky, we have Venus. That's uh, really nice and bright too. So let me bring on another picture here. Um, this one here. This is when I, this is when I snapped uh, the other day uh, with uh, Jupiter, Mars, and our crescent moon from uh, Martello Tower, and there's Saturn there again. Um, and uh, I had another one here that I had grabbed as well with with our with our uh, crescent moon sitting there, and Partridge Island sitting down there. That's a difficult shot to to to, uh, to capture because you're trying to get the light <laughs> of the lighthouse there at the same time. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you know I, I must have clicked 50 times before I actually got the light beam. At, at the right moment. Um, we have another one here from Trudy. Uh, where Trudy shared uh, this double uh, iridium flare. Of course, the iridium satellites are now gone, but uh, she was a, a really f a dedicated fan of, of the iridiums for sure. And she's got captured many photos uh, over the time uh, that I've uh, known her that of, of these uh, iridiums. This one's taken back in February 5th of 2018. So he's, uh, she's got iridium 90 there and iridium 12. Um, and now those are iridium satellites, of course, with, were for the iridium uh, sat phones. And they were a nice satellite because they reflected a lot of sunlight back at the planet. Um, so, and I, I, Mike has said that there's a, a site, I think Cal Sky, you used to be able to go to Cal Sky. And if you found a really bright one, uh, if you're standing on the right place on the planet, it would actually light you up uh, as it passed over you. That's how much reflected light it would uh, pass out. But now... The satellites have got much smaller, and they they don't uh, they're not covered with reflective material, so they don't uh, they don't give us this kind of a show anymore. But so Trudy does have these uh, for sharing, and I appreciate that, Trudy. Thanks for sharing that, uh, Brad as well. Thank you for sharing yours. And I don't know if I had uh, the capture here or not. Let's see if I can get back to my main screen without 
minimizing you guys. And I think I can get back here just a second. Um, I've got a clip here somewhere. I think it's this one. Can you see this one now? Just a second. Come on, open up. Here we go. No, there it is. No, that's not it. There it is. No, that's not it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, forget it. <laughs> anyway, yeah, this is the one. There it is. I'll bring it. I'll drag this one over. Now, can you see this one? With the uh, Sunday Night Astronomy Show logo on it. And what I was trying to show here was the address down here at the bottom, Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com. So if you would like to send your photos in to us to uh, feature them on our program, we would love to have your photos. I don't care if they're recent or not, just a capture of, uh, of maybe some planets that you've uh, taken captures of or the sun, the moon, <laughs> whatever you'd like to share. Uh, we're, we're happy to share them uh, here on our, on our program. So that's what I get to say about uh, photos, I guess. There you go. For the moment, so... Uh, let's take no, yeah, wait one more. Okay, well let's bring this one over to eh, there. So looking southeast now, as we're going to see over the next little while, uh, this is the 22nd. So uh, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, nicely lined up, and again Mars is going to drift farther down, so that we're going to have Mars, Saturn, and Jupiter in a nice line here over the next couple of weeks. So lots, lots of planetary viewing to uh, to enjoy over the next little while for sure. All right, let me get back out of this stuff and get back to you guys here you are right there cool all right uh, i guess i'll stop sharing my screen and uh who are you on now well who's up next well um it's <laughs> 10 after nine 10 after nine okay yes it is <coughs> um but if you want to look at something i do have um m95 and m96 up Sure. Okay. So if I, I could. Uh, Mark Aaron's change still still too low. It's if, still in the trees for my place. If everybody's okay, we'll continue on here. Um, I know we're a little bit after nine. We try to go for an hour show, but I think we're going yeah, along here working? okay. So yeah, who's working? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm clicked on you, Paul. Maybe you can click on me as well. Yeah, just a second. Or, I'm just gonna yeah. do one more little thing all to right. my I'm trying to get my picture so you guys can see it all. There we go. That's getting closer. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm just going to grab this and try to put it back over here and, and cross my fingers that it works. Because it, um, no, it's not going to work that way. Maybe I do it this way. There we go. And um, there. I'll say, hello. I'll say hello to Amelia and Trudy as well on there. Hello, Amelia okay. and Trudy. Hello, there. Amelia and Trudy. Hey, how you doing? Okay, so Paul, um, have you are you sharing your screen at the moment? I couldn't tell you. <laughs> Just one second. Okay. <laughs> Share screen, and we'll see if we go back and okay, yep. deliver you or not. No, just a sec. Okay, I'm seeing that on. Facebook? Why am I not seeing yeah, that? Yeah, I'm just going back into Oblivia, but maybe I can pull Oblivia out of it. You're on You're there, on Facebook. See that? Yeah, I see it. I see it on Facebook. That's there it is. Yeah, there it is. And now it's there on you YouTube. Go. Perfect. Yep. All right. So right now, well, I'm just, I've only got eight frames, nine frames now of this stack, 23 seconds each. Uh, but let's see if we can take a quick look inside of what we got there. So let's go to uh, 40%. And what we're showing are two galaxies. And these ones are, um, if you're looking under the belly of a Leo, uh, these ones are up a little higher than uh, what the Leo triplet is. Okay. So, um, and let me see if I can show you here. So I'm just going to reel this out. Okay, so uh, last night we were looking at <clears throat> the Leo triplet, which sits right here. And oh, Can you see that on the screen? Or can you see, uh, or is it yep. still just? Yep, we can see it. Okay, so there's uh, the Leo triplet, and then tonight what we're looking at is M95 and M96. Now, there's three galaxies in there, but the field of view that I have won't show me all three, but I can show you these two, and that's these two galaxies right here. 
M95 and M96. So that's what we were looking at, which are these galaxies right here. Right. And so basically what's happening is these galaxies are just, uh, I'm just starting to stack with this because I couldn't get the other stuff we were looking at to begin with. So, yep. but in any event, um, they're starting to stack up and they're starting to look pretty good. So can you explain stacking for a second, Paul? Oh, sure. So just for um, the ones who are on here who are not sure about it, so. Okay, so what's happening is um, I'm using a, a, a camera, a special um, uh, high frame rate camera on the back of my telescope, and I'm pointing up at this part of the sky. And um, what's happening is every, if you look over here where it says exposure, every 23 seconds, the camera is taking a picture and is sending it into the computer. So every 23 seconds, I have a new picture. And what happens is each of those pictures gets put right on top of the one before and on the one before. So if you look down in this corner here, right now it says I've got 14 pictures. When that gets up to about, say, 25 to 30 pictures, then these galaxies you see right here and here will start to become brighter. There'll be more detail and we'll start to see more color and whatnot in the stars. I can actually boost the color up just a bit now. But... Um, so that's basically what that is. So that's what stacking is. So it's just basically taking a picture and then putting on top of another and putting on top of another. And electronically, they can do that while we're actually live looking at this. So that instead of you looking through, a, um, say, a telescope or a pair of binoculars or anything looking at the night sky, our eye can only basically uh, process so much, which is not, you know, almost neg negligible in color. So what the stacking does is it does more than what our eye does. It does what, I, what our eye would see, and then let's put that aside and look at it again and take that same vision and put it on top. And that's what stacking does, really. It just stacks all the pictures so that you can actually see color in detail so that when you look through astronomy magazines and you look at these wonderful pictures that you see people producing, this is basically how they do it. Perfect. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. We're still going out on YouTube, okay? I'm just looking at uh, uh, an error here, but I'm not gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm going to ignore that one like I did before. Yeah, we're still on Facebook. I can see it here. Okay. Yep. So anyway, so that's those two galaxies right there, and again, that they, they will start to get a little better. I can zoom in a little closer and uh, have a look at one of one or the other of them. I can talk a little so bit about. Uh, yeah, there you go. That's look at that, that, looks, eh? that looks like Isn't M95. That... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So, um, so and basically have a circle going on and then the line through it. So that would be um, uh, a face, what they call a face on galaxy. So it would be like if we're looking at um, our Milky Way galaxy and if we could get way above it and look right straight down on it as it laid fat, flat on the floor, that's the, the, um, the, the uh, uh, perspective that we see uh, this particular galaxy. Oh, barred spiral. Barred spiral face on. Mm, nice. Uh, so that's uh, located about 33 million light years away, apparently. It was discovered by Pierre uh, Messiaen in 1781 and cataloged by French astronomer Charles Messier four days later. Oh, he beat him to it. <laughs> <laughs> so it is Messier 95, but uh, I guess... Uh, it was it was cataloged by Charles Messier, so he got the uh, the credit for it. Wow! On March the sixteenth of twenty twelve, a supernova was d discovered inside M ninety five. There was something I was reading about galaxies, and especially in this area, and then as you get further down to the Virgo cluster, that they say that most galaxies have a supernova or two or three within them anyway. Hmm. I wonder if that's to do with the gravitational pull uh, happening in, in the, you know, these large starburst uh, areas that are building around them, too. That's a good question. Or maybe it's just the fact that the star aged and it had to uh, was at the end of its life. That's probably more like it. <laughs> 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 I, I throw these fantasy things in there every once in a while. It's science fiction, you know. I just had enough time to get out of here, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> Well, you know, the, the interesting thing about space is a lot of it is theory and, um, you know, based on obviously scientific theory. So lots of times they, they're assuming something for many, many, many years, and then they find out that they were wrong. Yeah. So. I like I like when they say that they're wrong. 
<laughs> Messier 95 uh, has the designation of NGC 30. Oh, sorry, Mike, go ahead. I was going to say, my wife will never be an astronomer because she's never wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to avoid that. I knew that was coming. <laughs> we'll leave that one alone. Hope can <laughs> Uh, this galaxy is uh, one of the fainter objects in the Messier catalog. In large binoculars, it only shows as a hazy smudge, but it can be easily seen in the small telescope. Uh, six and eight inch telescopes reveal a diffused oval ball of light with a brighter center, and the galaxy's sparse structure is only visible under exceptionally good conditions. So we got it there, though. Yeah, we did. Yeah. We did. You can start to see, too, Chris uh, and Mike, that there's the, the center part of the galaxy, but you can start to see some spiral uh, things starting to happen here. I don't know if you can or not, but yeah. I can see my computer screen. Yeah, yeah it's starting to come out. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Some spiral arms. Yeah. This is the, and this is the great thing about stacking, folks, is that uh, we're just collecting a photo here every 20 seconds, Paul? Uh, 23 seconds, yeah. 23 seconds, and stacking it on top of the last one. So the images will just continue to get better and better uh, the longer we sit on these objects. And of course, these are live views too. So uh, these are actually 33 million light years away. So we're looking at light that left there 33 million years ago. Unreal. So we're not seeing the galaxy as it is today. We're seeing it as it was 33 million years ago, which is... Uh, really uh, an odd concept i know it is it's it's the relationship between space and time that uh, that brings us back to all of this right i'm just adjusting the picture there so mm. excuse me will i adjust it yeah how we have to take space as as a uh, as a measurement of time is some is a concept that a lot of people struggle with as i did when i first considered it but when I start thinking about the fact of how light has to travel from that distant uh, galaxy to our eyes, traveling at 300,000 kilometers per second, and it takes 33 million years to reach us. Wow. Unreal. That is unreal. So this is an example of some of the galaxies that we see in, in what we call our galaxy season now, because this is what we're, we're into now, is galaxy season, springtime of the year, and we've got a number of people. I think Emil as well, our local uh, astrophotographer out of, uh, out of uh, Baktouche, is out this evening as well, uh, doing a Messier marathon. And I think Trudy's also out trying to get her Messier marathon uh, working on. So uh, this is one time a year when you can actually get uh, most of these Messier objects, which we call, there's 110 of them all together. Um, some of them are clouds of dust and gas, which are old nebula. Uh, some are areas, uh, birthplace of brand new stars. Uh, some of them are galaxies like these that we see. And uh, we've got uh, globular clusters, large clusters of stars. Uh, so there's 110 of them in just about a one week a year right around this week, actually, uh, this is the time when uh, when astronomers can get out and try to capture as many of them as they can in one night. And uh, the trick is really to try to do it with a manual telescope. Um, Computer-guided scopes you can get to that, well, once they align on the sky like we're using here tonight, um, you just have to punch in the coordinates of the object or punch in the name of the object in a lot of cases, and it'll actually, the telescope will slew right around to that target. But that's that's... Uh, showing you that the telescope knows where it is, but you might not know where it is. So it's a lot more difficult to find these manually, but you can do it as long as you learn how to star hop and learn out where, where they are in constellations, that type of thing. But so it is a, it is kind of a rite of rite of passage for amateur astronomers to to go through this Messier marathon, and uh, this is the time to do it because now our moon is down basically. Um, we're in new new moon cycle, I think tomorrow. Uh, so we don't have any moon in our, our evening sky to cause any light pollution, to to, uh, to drown out the, the view of these uh, distant objects here. So this is a great time for us to be out uh, doing this kind of stuff as well, capturing deep sky objects and live stacking them, because uh, this is the time that astronomers like the most right now. Clear nights, uh, fairly dry. There is some humidity in the air, of course, always, but uh, it's a nice clear cold night. Your telescope cools down really quickly. Um, we've got a, a moonless night here and uh, 
a nice dark sky with an opportunity to offer a nice view like this. Remember now we're looking at something that's 33 million light years away so. Six and eight inch telescopes reveal a diffuse oval ball of light with a brighter center and the galaxy's bar structure is only visible under exceptionally good conditions. Messier 95, the nearby intermediate spiral galaxy M96 and elliptical M105 can be found roughly a third of the way from Regulus, the bright star in Leo, down to De Nebula, the third brightest star in the constellation. And uh, Messier 95 is a member of the M96 group, also known as the Leo 1 group, or Leo I group, I guess. Leo 1, I think it is. It's a group of gravitationally bound galaxies within the Virgo supercluster. That's why they're so far away, the 30 million uh, light years away. They're in the supercluster, which is really what we're part of as well. The M96 group also includes the Messier galaxies M96, M105, and at least 21 fainter members, Paul. So can we find them on there? <laughs> <laughs> 21 of them. Look real Once, close. <laughs> Once we stack up, we'll find them. <laughs> M96 is the brightest and the largest member of the group with a linear diameter of 80,000 light years compared to M105's 55,000 light years and M95 46,000 light years. The galaxies in the Leo 1 group will eventually merge to form a giant elliptical galaxy. M105, one of the last objects added to the Messier catalog, was not introduced by Messier himself but by Helen Sawyer Hogg in 1947. <clears throat> M95 is home to around 40 billion stars. 40 billion. Wow. And we estimate about 400 billion in hours. It has a well-defined spiral structure. It is nearly circular spiral, spiral arms and is classified as a type SBB, a barred spiral galaxy. The galaxy's central bar is surrounded by tightly wound spiral arms dotted by star-forming regions dust lanes and clusters of young blue stars. M95 is actually receding from us at the speed of 778 kilometers per second. Huh. Well, so that's going away from us at that speed. At that speed, yeah. Um, it doesn't it doesn't really look it, does it? No, <laughs> not moving at all. <laughs> no. I suppose in 30 million light years, 778 kilometers per second, probably you wouldn't really no. notice it. Probably not that much. No. Give, give or take a kilometer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, Paul. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're going to say that if I sat on that for a little while, it would uh, it would start to come out because the stars are really starting to pop now. And you can see mm -hmm. that little, there's another galaxy right down in here, another one right in the boat here. Yeah. There's all kinds of little ones in there, but um, <clears throat> as a picture stacks, you get more of that detail. We're going to leave you out. We're, we're going to let you try to find all 21 there. Oh, great. <laughs> Maybe that'll be your Messier Marathon run. <laughs> there you are. All right. I'll just that'll work. <laughs> yeah, whoops. Uh, yep. Yep. There you go. Perfect. You're back. Thanks. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Uh, 19 concurrent virus. So still got, still got a lot of people on here anyway. That's good. Yeah, um, yet, yeah. Not night. No, Mike. Uh, what are you up to? About five, eight and a half. Yeah, I know. <laughs> wah, wah. Wah, wah. Well, let me show you. Okay. Uh, so, not gonna be quite as clear as Polywogs, but uh, it should come up pretty good. This is M81 and M82. Yep. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yep. um, uh, that's only till... five thirty-second images stacked. Paul, I'll get you to click on uh, Mike. Yeah, I did. Okay, yeah. yeah. Just wait Let me just update. see if I have to unshare here first. No, I'm not sharing, so. Okay, so if you're clicked on and Mike, I it should pop on, up. In... I'm clicked on Mike. Okay, it should pop up in a second. You, do, do. you learn patience right in this hobby, eh? You sure do. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be a producer. Thanks very much. Uh, there we are. We're up. Perfect. Yeah, so M81, M82, uh, another set of galaxies that are quite a distance away, 12 uh, million light years away. We're looking down into. Do you have a Do you have a program up, Mike, that you can show where they are? Or? Uh, ooh, yeah. yeah, maybe not. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Just, okay. Uh, I got to minimize this. Yep. It's going to be a little slow because I'm short. Yeah. 
It's Sunday. We're supposed to slow down. Yeah, maybe exactly. Slow. <laughs> Pull up this one. There you go. Here. There we go. And get right on it. Yep. Open wide. Take a second or two. Now, uh, where'd you go? Come down. There we are. So here's so, the Big Dipper, or Ursa Major. Right, upside down. Upside down. There's the uh, the pot. And if you come off those two stars in a diagonal, almost perfectly straight out the same distance, you'll have M81 and M82. So, again, galaxy season, but these two are up. Uh, these are all well, pretty well circumpolar, I guess. Eh? The, I mean, yeah, they're up, yeah. up all, all year, year long. Year. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the ones that were yeah, up I'm all was putting the scope straight up, too. Yeah, right. So, I mean, uh, of course, the Big Dipper rotates around Polaris uh, throughout the evening. So, but uh, at this time of year, they're they're up uh, nice and high there. So, uh, these are circumpolar. So, these are the ones that never set, basically. Um, so, you should be able to pick them out at any time of year. And Mike is looking uh, into, uh, again, those two stars that make up the last two stars of the pot. Um, take those two stars straight out and... Uh, about the same distance. Actually, if you, yeah, if you go from the bottom left of the pot, I guess, to the top right, and about almost yeah. the same distance again. Straight out. And that's what I use for a daub to try to find them. And now you were looking at uh, M81 and M82 right there. That's these two galaxies here. So, again, Mike is, is live stacking. What do you get up there for images now, Mike? Every 30, 30 seconds, I guess? Yeah, I've um, uh, got seven, seven images stacked in 30 seconds. Seven at 30 seconds, yeah. Blow it up a little bit here. Uh -huh. I got a little bit of drift because my alignment's not working correctly. Yeah. But well, uh, still looks there. Right. Yep. <laughs> Let me you can really sure see that, that M80, uh, M82, the uh, separation in the. Yeah, sep in the <coughs> yeah. 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 Really nice. So M81 there, uh, the one on the right, I guess, is M81, uh, also known as NGC 3031 or uh, Bode's Galaxy is a grand spiral design galaxy about 12 million light years away with a diameter of about 90,000 light years. So just slightly smaller than our galaxy. And it's a new constellation of Ursa Major, of course, which is, uh, we, I mean, we call it the Big Dipper, but Big Dipper is really just an asterism. Um, it's not, the, the, the actual constellation is Ursa Major. Due to its proximity to Earth, uh, large size and active galactic nucleus, um, Messier 81 has been studied extensively by professional astronomers. The galaxy's large size and relatively high brightness also makes it a popular target for amateur astronomers. And what is awful nice is when um, you've got these two galaxies like this in your eyepiece at the same time. So, and, and again, uh, we get the time of year like now uh, in the spring when we can get uh, two or more galaxies in our eyepiece at this time of year. Uh, but uh, we can't normally get them in the in the summertime when, unless we look at areas like this, I guess. Well, I mean, we've got Leo up again in the summertime as well, but yeah. But it's awful nice. To get, these these are two easy ones, I guess, to pick up, right? Sorry. I was going to say when you get into Markarian's chain, then you're going to see tons of them. Yeah, exactly. I shouldn't call it that. That's that actually is called what the Virgo cluster. That whole area. Well, Markarian's chain is that is that chain of, of island uh, galaxies there, all lined up for sure. Uh, we are into the Virgo cluster though when we're when we're looking at that area, about two thousand galaxies in that in that right. section, right. yeah, of the sky. I think there's seven that are that make up Markarian's chain. So this uh, this one here is uh, located about uh, ten degrees north of of Elsa. Alpha Ursa Majoris, along with several other galaxies in the M81 group. And who's dinging my phone here? Oh, go away. <laughs> I thought your fries were done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was hoping they are done. I'm getting kind of hungry. Uh, yeah, we'll turn that down. Ah, yeah, somebody sent me a James Taylor clip. That's cool. Um, M81 and M82 can both be viewed easily using binoculars and small telescopes. The two objects are generally not observable to the unaided eye, although highly experienced amateur astronomers 
may be able to see M81 under exceptional observing conditions with a very dark sky. I don't think I've ever seen them even from Mount Carlton. No. Uh, no. I mean, Andromeda stands right out at you for sure when you're looking at the, at the sky for that one. And mm -hmm. actually, I've seen Andromeda from St. Charles Beach pretty easily as well, but um, it's a lot brighter, I guess. Yeah. And we're only talking two and a half million light years away for Andromeda, where we're talking 12 million light years away for these two guys. The distances are just like, they're just oh, they're mind boggling. <laughs> Telescopes with apertures of about eight inches or larger are needed to distinguish the structures in the galaxy. Its far northern declination makes it generally visible for observers in the northern hemisphere. It's not visible to most observers in the southern hemisphere, except for those in a narrow latitude line uh, immediately south of the equator. And uh, M82 here, which is the uh, the other one on the other side, we call it Cigar Galaxy. And it looks like a cigar. Yeah. It's actually a starburst galaxy about 12 million light years away. A member of the 80, M81 group, it's about five times more luminous than the whole Milky Way. Wow. And has a center uh, 100 times more luminous than our galaxy's center. The starburst activity is thought to have been triggered by interaction with the neighboring galaxy M81. As the closest starburst galaxy to Earth, M82 is a prototypical example of this galaxy type. A type 1a supernova was discovered in the galaxy on January 21st of 2014. And M82 was first discovered by Johann Alert Bode on the 31st of December, 1774 together with M81, he described it as a nebulous patch, a very pale and elongated shape. In 1779, Pierre Michel independently rediscovered both galaxies and reported them to Charles Messier, who added them to his catalog. So that's why they're called M81 and M82 from Messier 81 and Messier 82. Hello, Gail, uh, joining us here on YouTube. Welcome. Just looking on for comments and Paul the ketchup. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're looking after the Facebook comments, I see, Paul. That's good. <laughs> said, What's that with ketchup? What's that all about? <laughs> Mike got us hungry. He said French fries and then uh, uh, <laughs> in <Boston laughs> fries and ketchup. <laughs> Take that on, Mike. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Uh, M82 was belie previously believed to be an irregular galaxy in 2005. However, two symmetrical spiral arms were discovered uh, in the near infrared images of M82. And the arms were detected by subtracting, uh, blah, 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 whatever, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice view. <laughs> <clears throat> In 2005, the Hubble Space Telescope revealed 197 young massive clusters in the starburst core. So that's pretty cool. It's bigger than my telescope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what scope are you using for this one, Mike? That's my 66 uh, William Optic SD with the uh, Canon DSLR camera. Oh, nice. Nice capture. Yeah. Nice wide field of view. It's beautiful. Mm. A little too to wide, I think. I gotta move up to a little bit bigger scope. Well, when you start uh, pointing at that nebula, so you'll, you'll find that it'll be just right. Yeah. There are certain ones, of course, but. Oh, don't worry. I'll get up into uh, signals there this summer while you're over in Virgo. <laughs> <laughs> we got them hooked now. <laughs> oh yeah, I got. I heard that. <laughs> I was waiting for that one for a long time. Signus, signus. Yeah. Virgo, 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 Virgo. <laughs> yeah, it's coming. We'll get them hooked. No question. I couldn't resist. Oh, Sorry. I, think, I think we get them hooked now. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. He got he got Markarian's chain there the other night, so he's quite happy. So Yeah. Excuse me just for a second. Oh, I thought I had a sneeze coming on, but I guess not. There. Anyway. Well guys, we're into nine thirty, uh nine forty, I guess. So maybe yeah. uh, we should call this a night and uh oh, wow. Time flies when you're having fun. Sure does. Uh next yeah. week now, keep an eye, folks, because we may oh, be switching sure. our time up next week. Uh if this uh, social distancing thing continues here and some people are taking the day, uh, you know, taking some time off from work and that kind of thing, we may end up switching to our nine o'clock uh, time frame uh, simply because uh, 
it's getting more difficult for us to able to offer objects uh, like we are tonight here. Uh, we, I mean, here we are in the 9:30, and we're finally able to get up uh, a view of M81, M82. Markarian's chain, Paul. I guess that, that probably right around now you might be able to start stacking it. Yeah, right now yeah. we start start being able to get good views of it now. Yeah. So we, I mean, we knew this was coming. We we knew that uh, we were going to be in this position as yeah. as time moved on here. So possibly what we'll start doing is start uh, offering the show at 9 p.m. Uh, the live show and then of course it's up on YouTube uh, within I think it's about uh, two hours later it's it's offered back up on YouTube again so you can always go back and watch it later on if you like uh, we'd love to you to do that if you do um, and I'd like to see how uh, your comments come in here too as far as the uh, the simulcast went tonight uh, if you had any problems with uh, Facebook or YouTube uh, catching our volumes or, or picking up the pictures or anything like that I'm trying to watch uh, three screens here at once myself <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that everything came through okay for everybody. And uh, what we'd like to do is uh, maybe extend this out. Uh, between now and our next uh, Sunday Night Astronomy show, we might offer uh, one or two uh, another uh, Facebook live feeds coming up, uh, simply uh, if we have some time in between. We know that there's a long stretch in between. There are a lot of people that have families at home too right now that, that might enjoy uh, these these type of live streams and, and information that we can provide to you. So... Uh, We'll, we'll see you for sure next next Sunday night on YouTube. And um, we're going to be uh, looking at maybe a 9 o'clock form. But if that does happen, I'll be putting a post up on my Facebook page. And I'll put a comment up here on my on our YouTube channel too to let you know uh, that uh, we'll be moving the time frame from 8 till 9. And again, that's only simply because of the fact that uh, that time uh, is creeping up on us now. And as astronomers, we need dark skies to be able to offer you some live stacking. Now... Uh, saying all that, we do have lots of topics that we can talk about as well. Uh, for we've we've <laughs> we've had our we've certainly had our run of cloudy nights along the way here, uh, getting to the point where we could actually offer anything at all. So we've we've got some topics saved up that we can offer uh, if uh, if it comes to that. So uh, on that note, I guess uh, what we'll do is we'll we'll call it a night for tonight. Um, I wanted to let people know too that if you go to Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com and send me your photos, uh, whether you send them through uh, the YouTube link or send them through Facebook, it doesn't matter. Just, they just go to that email address. I go into that address quite often and take a look and see if there have been any uh, photos shared with us. We'd love to share your photos up here on on uh, on the YouTube channel as well. And, of course, they're going out on the Facebook if we can do a simulcast. Uh, for any of you who are on uh, YouTube here and you're not subscribers, we would love to see you subscribe. Uh, we're seeing that our numbers are climbing here steadily. We're really happy with that. We're very pleased with, with that fact, for sure. And uh, if you uh, liked the what material that you saw here tonight, please leave us some comments or give us a, a thumbs up or a like here on, on YouTube and even on Facebook, if you could. Uh, we're trying to continue to offer the stuff through as much as we possibly can. Uh, and our idea here is to try to educate people. We understand that everybody's doing some uh, uh, social distancing and staying at home at the moment. Uh, classes are uh, are uh, off off limits at the moment, and our outreach is, is minimal at best. And we understand that that's going to continue for a while yet. So we'll try to bring you as much as we can through our live feeds uh, and these and these offerings here um, over the next little while. So thank you uh, all for, for staying with us. Mike, uh, Paul, thanks so much, guys, for being on board with us again here tonight. And uh, we really enjoyed uh, your uh, your setups there tonight. So, folks, uh, as we say here uh, in uh, Facebook and YouTube land from the Sunday Night Astronomy Show, uh, guys, keep your scopes. Thanks, folks, for tuning in, and we'll talk to you all again real soon. Clear skies, everybody, and I hope you have a great week, and everybody stay safe and uh, take care out there, okay? We'll talk to you all again soon. Salute. Right.